Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Deb Coviello. Deb is a business advisor, coach, author, speaker, and podcast host. She has more than 20 years of experience in quality manufacturing and operational excellence. She is known as the drop-in CEO because she drops into struggling businesses and assumes the CEO role. She is the host of the Drop-In CEO podcast and author of The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track. I am excited to have her on the show to learn from her experiences. So Deb, welcome to the show. Oh, John, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I too look forward to learning from you. We always have something to learn in the area of leadership. So thank you again. Well, it's great to have you on the show. And I'm excited about this because, uh, you know, we mostly because of your background is very interesting. It's very similar to mine. So that's what I want to start out with is um, tell us about your experiences and, and how you kind of came up through uh, through your journey and your career. Like me, you're an engineer who came through quality and manufacturing operational excellence. Tell us a little bit about that. So thank you again for the opportunity. You know, I started out uh, as actually a biology major because I love science and technology. But when I realized I was not going to go to medical school, I switched over to biomedical engineering. And the interesting thing was, as I was pursuing that curriculum, I realized that I actually preferred manufacturing. There was one course in my junior year where we took nothing and turned it into something, robotic arms, uh, stacking blocks, mixing things, heating things up. I simply loved that creative process, which may actually go to my roots of being a creative and then later changing into a STEM professional. But fast forward, I love the opportunity to be potentially financially independent by pursuing engineering and manufacturing. And during that time, I pursued quality, you know, better, faster, cheaper, safer, and also operational excellence. How can I remove the waste, the defects, et cetera? <laughs> and something happened along the way. I started realizing I don't like chaos. I mm. don't like disruptive situations. Perhaps from my upbringing, I like bringing peace and consensus. And so there was this DNA inside of me that wherever I landed within operations, yes, I had a responsibility to the quality, assuring customer loyalty to the brand that we were providing them. But along the way, I would then fall into situations where there is noise and chaos in manufacturing. <laughs> and sometimes people simply accept the fact that we're always putting out fire. And then I said, no, there is a better way. Let's get the right foundation, the standards, the procedures, the processes, the training in place such that we can do that value added work and grow the business. And so I think over time, even though I honed my craft and quality and engineering, my greatest gift was to be able to look at the landscape, look at the operations and be able to say what's missing, what's, mm. what's not working in the foundation. And later, later. When I was surrounded by a lot smarter people than me on my staff, I realized my greatest gift was not to be the firefighter, but the one that could elevate the capability and the confidence of the people in my organization to do the work that they were best suited to do. And so that's how my leadership really came to being in the last few years of my corporate job was, yes, I can be a, a subject matter expert in engineering, solving flavors and fragrance and manufacturing problems, but my greatest legacy was to be able to elevate the leaders of tomorrow. So that's my story sticking with it. That's how I arrived at what I'm doing now and now in my own business. Yeah, fan fantastic. And one of the things that was interesting about your background is you actually are were you're an avid curler uh, with the Cincinnati Curling Club. And I don't think I've ever met a curler before, but how did you get involved with that? It's very unique. Um, you know, it seems like it only comes out when you see the Winter Olympics every four years, but uh is that something that's a uh, big in Cincinnati or? <laughs> well, it's growing because when I arrived in Cincinnati, I had started curling back in New Jersey about 15 wow. years ago. My boss at a fragrance company said, hey, would you like to try it? And uh, I said, <laughs> okay. Uh, and it was at that point in my life where I had three children. The first one was finally flowing flying the coop to go to college. And I said, you know, I got to get a life back. All I was, was a mother and I was a career person and I did nothing for myself. So I took the leap into <laughs> curling. But then when I had the opportunity for a promotion to move out to Cincinnati, Ohio, there was a very, very small club of 13 people. I found them. I left the community. We've built the club. We're now at about 145 people wow. with a dedicated club and I could go on and on, but there are so <laughs> many similarities between simply the sport yeah and strategy and business 
Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Definitely. That's really cool. So, so, uh, and it's, I guess it's not just for the Olympics anymore, right? Sounds like it's, it's not, you know, it's another alternative for self-expression. It's another yeah, community. Yeah. It, it is, is something that you can learn the sport within 10 minutes and take a lifetime to hone your craft. But not only is it simply the sport and you can be competitive. I did get a silver medal in 2017 <laughs> at the arena national level, but it is also a tremendous social sport. Uh, a lot of community and you can walk into any curling club and feel immediately at home. Mm, so very cool. That's yeah. interesting. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, um, as you went through your career, I like, I like what you said, the idea, you know, and again, it comes from, from a quality and operational excellence is this idea of eliminating chaos, right? Eliminating variation, eliminating waste. I mean, it's, it's getting things organized and running efficiently. Like you said, it's, it's it's procedures processes but it's also training and people and it's a lot a lot involved with with this and i know because i have similar experiences in my career when did you decide that like okay you know all this experience i have all these things that i've done all these um uh all these chaotic situations i've put in order when did you say you know what i i want to, i really want to help business leaders i want to help uh people that are running either small businesses larger businesses that and like you know, I want to help them get their, their, their ship straight and, and run, uh, you know, and get rid of the chaos in their business. When did you feel like, boy, this is something that I really could, could, could be, do really well uh, at helping uh, other businesses? So when November, 2018, I was asked to leave the company that I was at. So I had been outgrown and they wanted to replace, and it was a dark time. Mm. However, I will tell you, sometimes these things happen are blessings because it gave me the time and opportunity. And I will say at a few tears, walking many miles, consuming so many podcasts and books for me to start reflecting, I had a whiteboard full of ideas. And then when I started realizing what was I good at, I was mm. good at operations and quality. But also, what was my passion and skill? I loved to quiet the storm. I could had this skill of going into a room. There's a new issue. There's a customer complaint. They are going to pull our their business from us. And so often you go into an organization and there's so much noise. And I had the unique ability to be able to listen and be able to come forward and reframe, you know, this is what I think the problem is and how we need to move forward. Mm. And people would be taken aback and said, yes, that's the problem. And then we could have constructive discussion and the actions needed to be taken. Because so often people will be in a frenzy, they're too close to the problem. And leadership is that element of being able to listen 70% of the time and be able to come forward only 30% of the time and speak great wisdom. And so I realized I didn't want to go back to the large corporations. Mm -hmm. I knew my capability and my skills would be embraced by the small and medium-sized companies that maybe they were okay with the skills that they had up to this point. But as they saw the landscape change and they were growing, they realized they didn't have the capability and capacity, mm. hence the drop in CEO. That's where I could drop in and provide all of my years of expertise in a very rapid place and time to get them through whatever the storm was and get them to a new level of performance. It was during that time I realized this was what I was meant to be and to mm, do. Fantastic. That, yeah. That's really neat. And, and I like what you say, because I think it's really important. I mean, I'm, I'm a CEO myself. I have a mm. uh, manufacturing company I run. And I think it is so important to have uh, another set of eyes and to look at a situation or to listen to this, the story, because, you know, I, as a CEO, you're, I am deep in it. Like I, I, you know, I am, I am, you know, up to here with all, I know, I know my customers, my customer issues. I know, I know my, my products and the, in the, the, the weaknesses, the strengths I, you know, and I know every bit about it. And so sometimes it's hard to see, the forest through the trees because you're deep into the details of the business, every single detail, you know, and so it's nice to have another set of eyes. And I really do believe that's important to have a, a coach or have a mentor or have somebody that you can reach out to that it doesn't have, it's not up to here with all of the, the, the daily challenges, but can look at it from a very objective point of view. Do you find that that's, that is really powerful for, for these, uh, these business leaders when they have another set of eyes looking at it? 
Yeah. And, and there's different levels of leadership within those organizations. And the ones that are best for me are the ones that say, okay, I know I have a problem or I'm going to have a problem. Mm-hmm. Start looking for those resources that can help me. And then the hardest thing to do is pull the trigger and say, let's bring them in because they want to wait. They want to mm-hmm. wait. Things are okay. They want to wait. And then they go into crisis, which is the worst place to be. It's not just chaos putting out fires, but they go into crisis. And yes, I can jump in and drop in and help them. But th- this is this is one of the challenges that I see over and over again is that um, I was actually in one particular example brought into a company, they needed to get a certification in their mm-hmm. manufacturing operations in order to continue to do business with their number one supply, their customer. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's urgent, you know, if they don't get yeah. that certification, then uh, they could lose a significant part of their business. So I was brought in, and I absolutely could help them check the box and get those procedures, processes, training in place. But when I stepped back and realized, I said, oh my, they have a bigger risk. They are a family owned business with people that have been there 30, 40 years, lots of tribal knowledge. Everybody's got each other back, a great culture because people jump in. And then what happens if you lose just one individual? They didn't have things documented. They didn't have things cross-trained. So not only, yes, we had to do the training and the procedures, et cetera. I identified a risk in that business that they had a lack of redundancy. They did not preserve their intellectual property or their subject matter expertise. And they were at risk that one day when they don't plan for it, uh, they could go into a very crisis situation. So we really honed in on making sure that that business was redundant, started backfilling resources, Mm. et cetera, because that's what a business owner might not be able to see are those risks. But I come in with a separate set of eyes, I'm objective, and I can identify those things. So love, love, love working for those leaders that realize something's changing, and I better bring somebody in now so I can see the full picture. And I like what you said, too, is that they tend to wait. And again, I'm a CEO, so I tend to do the same thing sometimes is that you think, well, it's going to work out or this is going to happen or we maybe, maybe, uh, you know, things, you know, we wish that the situation will just sort of, uh, you know, rectify itself on its own. But, you know, one of the things I write about in, in one of my books is I talk about uh, you know, as, as, as a submarine officer and as a submariner, we're trained to run towards problems, run towards the fire and to, to address it, to take, to, to put it out quickly before it gets out of control. And I think a lot of times we, as CEOs, we, we don't run to the fire. We, we, it's a small fire. It might be burning and we're like, yeah, it's okay. I'll let it go. And the next thing you know, it's burning out of control. And then it's almost, it, you know, it's almost too late sometimes, but, uh, but you come in sometimes after the fire is already burning, but if they would call you in early before that fire gets out of control, we, you can have a, a much bigger impact, I would imagine, on, on, on the results of the organization. Yeah, I think one of the things that I learned real uh, often was that um, we need to look at the risks and opportunities. Again, not just the short-term things of, yes, I need to have certain amount of sales, uh, inventory uh, turns, or what have you, but you need to have another line item on what are all those things that are potential risk in my business? Mm -hmm. What plans can I put in place? And I just also wrote about this. You can have a crisis management plan. You could have a cybersecurity plan. You have your employees do fire drills occasionally children in schools do fire drills and sometimes other unfortunate types of drills. Mm, So why as leaders, do we not pressure test some of those things? So one of the things I also go in is, could you survive a crisis with the current systems that you have right now in place? Mm. I like to talk to leaders about uh, how could we run a drill and in the flavors and fragrance industries, we sometimes do mock recalls to make sure that everything uh, performs as expected. Because if you assume that crisis management plan or that procedure system is working, and yes, we've audited it, and that's fine, but auditing a process mm-hmm. under normal conditions isn't really actually how the business responds. So I absolutely also do that as doing risk mitigation, risk management, and sometimes pressure testing your systems to make sure they function as expected. Oh, I like that. I like that. That sounds really good. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you, you say that, that uh, the, this this phrase, and I like it, is this drop in CEO, which you, where you're kind of dropping in uh, to to you know almost like a paratrooper jump dropping in to to solve a problem, right? So, what are the types of problems that that leaders find themselves in, or where they where they you know is it is it uh, personnel issues? Is it is it manufacturing issues? Is it quality issues? What are the or or is it just sometimes uh, uh, overall? Uh, chaos that needs to be in order. What what you know? It, when you, what would you sort of characterize some of the types of problems that these uh, these companies get themselves into? 
Well, certainly I have dropped into my own situations, whether it is in quality or operational excellence. Uh, one, we may not be meeting budget. And so we need to put cost savings measures in place for which I was able to build an entire organization, align with the plant managers, and ultimately generate over $5 million in cost savings each year, leveraging, leveraging Six Sigma and Lean methodology such that we then could meet our budget to one of the times we were number four in quality from a four regions. And um, I knew I had to do something a little bit different. So I did do something different. It was a very human centric approach, approach rather than what am I going to reduce defects or work close with my customers? I very much focused on barrier removal with my people. That's where the human centric elements in the CEO's compass got developed because as I started behaving differently as a leader, as I started seeing the gifts of the people and where were they lacking confidence, how were they not able to articulate messages, removing those barriers, enabling them to perform at their highest level, I went from number four in quality reducing customer complaints and defects to number two out of four regions in 18 months, mm -hmm. because you focused on the things that were leading indicators. And this is what I feel strongly about. I also have dropped into other situations where again, they needed a certification. The operations could not keep up with sales. Mm -hmm. If you just measure the results in terms of sales, quality, service, inventory, EBITDA, you're always going to be chasing your tail because those are lagging indicators. Oh, absolutely. What I Okay, I start looking at what are the leading indicators. And in the CEO's compass, one of the compass points right next to True North is performance. But performance is not the business. It's important, but it's the performance of the people. And so you need to look at the people's capability and their capacity to do the work and the confidence. You focus on those. They already have the technical knowledge to do it. That's why you hired them. But mm. sometimes things get in the way. And so if you can start focusing on how do I build their capability? How do mm. I build the capacity to do the work, the increase in volume, et cetera? And by the way, confidence, they may not know how to articulate a message, say, hey, this audit that I did in your area, why aren't you getting your actions done? They may not know how to message and prioritize. Those are the skills as a leader. Those are leading indicators we need to focus on. You build those, they stick. Mm. And then as things change in the business, yes, you will eventually, you'll have lumps and bumps along the way, but eventually mm. you'll have sustainable results. This because leaders focus on just on results versus peace of mind and the performance of the people. Mm, I love that. I love that. And, you know, you talk about that on your podcast and I, and I like it. You talk about that, that you, you, you work to enhance the human element and increase the results they achieve. You know, I, I, I really like to, to hear that because a lot of times, you know, I talk about it in my, in my books is that when you're the leader, you're responsible for the people and the results. And I think we sometimes forget the people side of it. So why, why is the human element so important in achieving results? Well, let me perhaps answer that in terms of what is the outcome that I achieved with one particular individual. Mm -hmm. I had a subject matter expert reporting to me and he was very good. I mean, whenever we said like, hey, what are the standards for food safety? He would be able to articulate very well, here's the standards and here's what we need to do to implement. But I don't believe he was ever given proper feedback. And one of the things I started doing, again, focusing on the human, not sending them out for more training, not sending them out for more certifications, but I started asking, giving him more feedback and feedback. Again, this is the human element. People don't like giving or receiving feedback because it's mm. scary and we have no framework for it. When I start exercising feedback in the context of what to continue, what to change and what to start, actually it's change, start and, or sorry, continue, start and change. Those are very actionable versus saying, hey, you're doing okay. Hey, you're doing fine. There's nothing actionable around that. And it's also not a positive experience. So with this particular individual, when I focused on the human element, I saw them speaking. And this particular day, they were exceptional. They were getting a, a message out to the people that really I saw them leaning into it. And when I had the opportunity to meet with them, I didn't talk about the subject matter. I said, how did you think that opportunity or that presentation went? And he said, I think it went great. I said, can I give you some feedback? And he said, fine. I said, one, one thing that you need to do in this case, he, one, was articulate in his message, continue to do that. 
But the next thing I want you to start doing is in this particular instance, he stood when he delivered the message and you could see the body language of the people Mm. leaning into him. They were Mm. so much more engaged versus delivering a presentation when they sat. I told him that I said, you now need to always be standing when delivering your message. Again, focusing on the human, even if you're delivering it from your office. And he did that. And he says, I can do that. So very actionable. And then finally, I said, you need to change something. I said, you fidget, you put your hands in your pocket. You don't have Mm -hmm. stability with your hands. I said, perhaps you might want to ground yourself, have a pointer or a pen such that it doesn't detract from what you're already doing really well. And he says, I can do that. And (laughs) so this person, ultimately the outcome by focusing on his messaging, his appearance, his presence, enhancing what he already did well in his area of subject matter expertise. Not only did he work for me as an expert regionally, but he was sought out globally and he started becoming a global subject matter expert. Those are the stories we need to focus on as the human element. Not necessarily you're going to get that report for me and what's the results of that audit, but what can I do to remove the barriers and make them more successful? Mm, That's what leaders should be doing. Yeah, absolutely. I love to hear that. So I'm just... That's it's music to my ears. So <laughs> absolutely. So you have a new book out called The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track. Tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book. Okay. So <laughs> I had to write the book because I was all over the place. And I actually had somebody say, your content is great, but I don't know what you stand for. Ah. What's your system? What's your process? Mm. And I had been playing with this for the longest time. And just so you know, that compass was not always a compass. It was my house of quality with a roof and pillars and foundation and yada, that. yada, <laughs> yada. That's yeah, what the quality yeah. people are trained to do, make a house yes. of quality. And you know what? I realized that didn't resonate with senior leaders or CEOs. It just wasn't their thing. And I was noodling on a piece of paper. It could have been a napkin. All of a sudden I started putting it together in terms of a compass. And then I realized that now I had eight compass points that I'd been curating over the years. Peace of mind being the northernmost one in this Northern hemisphere purpose and performance. I added past and pride that was really missing Mm. dealing with the culture and the intellectual property of the people and also of course people process and platforms all of this came together and it really honed my message to a system that i use when i go into organizations and not tell a leader throw out their old process they've been good up until this point they've been okay right but sometimes they need course corrections because the environment or the situations change mm-hmm. and so it's almost like write your own story i don't know if you remember that as a kid but you can actually look at your situation and pick and choose a few compass points that maybe you need to do something differently like people it's not training your people. It's not hiring the right people. But what do you do actively as a leader to mentor their performance and leadership development? We don't do enough about that. So I give you a compass to pull out whenever you're off track. So I had to write the book to get the message out there. And I can't wait to get it into the hands of each and every senior leader that I meet. That's why I had to write it. And it seems to be resonating with a lot of people. Oh, that's fantastic. And I, you know, I think you, you, you hit on this and, and I think you're right. Number one being peace of mind, uh, mm-hmm. as a CEO, I, I don't know, there's, there's sometimes I have peace, but I, it's hard. I mean, uh, there's, do you know what that looks like? Do you yeah. know what peace of mind feels and looks like? Not every leader knows what that feels like. Do you yeah. know what that feels like? Yeah. I mean, I, I've had moments of, of, moments. of it in the business, but it, you know, I mean, we, we started the business six years ago and uh, you know, we're growing and, and there are times where everything is, you know, perfectly running great. You know, the people, everybody's happy. Uh, you know, we're, we're get orders are, are, are on time, you know, quality's perfect. Everything is just flowing, but the, but it's, 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 it's rare as an entrepreneur, I guess I would say where everything is running smooth. In most cases, there's always something that needs to be addressed. There's always some, there, you know, one of your cats has wandered out of the, ban- out of the, out of the barnyard and you're trying to figure it out. So, but, um, and I, I really like what you say that that's, that should be number one is peace of mind, because when you're, when you have peace of mind as a CEO, you know, things are running well. You've got everything, everything's moving in the direction that you, you you're it's consistent with the vision you have for the business, right? And, uh, and that's, and that's why I love what you say. And you say this is that 60, 60% of leaders feel depleted at the end of the day. And, and this makes it difficult to lead and inspire others. And I, and I do agree with that it is, um, how, you know, so why did you choose peace of mind and how can you help like these 60% of leaders that are just like, 
depleted and frustrated sometimes at the end of the day. So it's one of those aha moments when you reflect back on my own career. When did I experience peace of mind? Now, you could say, if you're fortunate to have children or perhaps nieces and nephews, and you see them, perhaps maybe they struggled as a student and then ultimately walking across and getting their diploma and they have an aspiration or a pursuit, that's peace of mind saying, okay, I've done my job or they've done their job. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry anymore. Similarly with your business, I remember we were trying to reduce defects for a particular issue in a manufacturing environment. So we're taking videos of the manager showing what we need to do as a training opportunity for their people. And the funny Mm -hmm. thing was the operator started nudging their way into the video. And you could see them in the background. And then we realized, let's stop recording. We asked them, do you want us to record you? And they said, yes. And so we started taping him and we said, okay, can you tell us about this process and how to do it? And he says, yes, I need to put my hand here and turn this crank. And I need to do it in this order, because if I don't do it this way, I'm going to contaminate the product and it's going to have a negative impact on my customer. And when we saw him speak and not only say what he was doing and why he was doing it and the impact on the customer, oh my, then you finally realize everything we have been doing to try to cascade all the knowledge and to the people that are the frontline worker that are closest to your customers, they understood their unique responsibility. Mm -hmm. That is peace of mind. Yeah, That is what we are seeking. Yeah. If you haven't felt that, that's why you're 60% depleted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you can connect your operators or everybody in the business towards the mission and they understand their role in the mission and they feel connected to the customers, it's a, it's a pretty amazing place to be. But, you know, again, as, as somebody who's run, uh, this is my ninth manufacturing business. Um, I learned that early on is that, uh, you know, when I, my first manufacturing plan to walk around and ask people what they did, and it was always like, well, I plate this part, or I, I sand this part, or I uh, heat treat this part, but they didn't know what the part went to, and then how it fit together at, overall, and what that product did for the customer at the end of the day. And one of the things that we did was we started training and teaching as to what our products did, and we we came up with a, we were making electrical products for electric utilities. And we said, you know, at the end of the day, we came up with, we help keep the lights on. And, it, and that, that, that was just something that just sort of connected with them. And there was almost a sense of pride because we talked about hospitals and schools and shopping malls, and we keep the power on and we keep things going. And you can almost sense like it, they changed from, I make this part to, I help keep the lights on. And it connected them to the bigger mission. And I think we need to do that as leaders is help, help our people understand the, how they're connected to the bigger picture. And I think that's what you said, as you're saying there is that peace of mind is when you see the operator, like, get it, you know, like, I, this is why I do what I do, because it's important for my customer, you know. So there's another nugget in that. And, and, and again, I'm grateful that you and I have both experienced that, but it goes to then another major foundation is the communication and messaging. We Mm. can communicate information saying, here's the company's vision. Here's who we serve. Here's the problem we solve. And yes, that's a great starting point. It's a framework, but you haven't connected with the humans. You Mm. haven't messaged You haven't created, you know, this is what we do, why we do it. Here is the opportunity. Here's the risk in the industry of not doing it. We need to, I guess, as leaders, get a little bit of coaching in the area of marketing because marketing is when taking the product or service and connecting emotionally to people. So again, I came out of the fragrance industry and it's not just mixing a bunch of chemicals and putting it into your laundry detergent or, um, you know, perfume. It's about creating an emotional experience to a memory. Mm And so that's a different kind of messaging versus we just make fragrances. And I think leaders could potentially benefit as they evolve their business. And sometimes when they get bigger and they don't know all the people on the shop floor and they don't, they're getting too big. And yes, they have these great PowerPoints and messaging. They need to get a little bit closer to marketing and understanding what will connect to all of those people and humans in their workforce, even if they can't physically connect with them. So think about getting a little bit of education in marketing in order to move everybody forward and have the purpose in mind and peace of mind. I like that. It's a great tip. Marketing is a great resource. I mean, I know in marketing, they talk about, you got to tell people seven times before they, you know, they hear it or understand it. And I think that that's the same thing with, with leading people is that 
you have to repeat it in multiple different ways, whether it's in a newsletter or in an all employee meeting, or as you walk around the shop floor, you're repeating that same message multiple different times before it sort of catches, you know, and that's all, it's all, it's a marketing, it's a marketing trick, you know, and it's the same thing. You're talking about convincing people and, and marketing is, is that's the, that's the science that's very good at this. So go, yeah, I think it's you a know, great advice. Go learn some marketing because that's a big part of leadership is marketing your ideas to a group of people. I'd like to just challenge one thing, may I? Sure, yeah. <laughs> seven absolutely. times, need to have it in their face seven times. You know what? I think that's the old way of doing business. Yeah. You just said, we keep the lights on. I yeah. got it right out of the gate. I say, okay, I know what your business is all about. Yeah. Once, because you picked the right message. Yeah. The drop-in and, CEO, keep the yeah. lights on. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. We lost our lighting when we, the other day with a, a, a storm. Once. It has to be the right message and people yeah. will, it'll be memorable. Well, I always say, keep it less than four words. And if you can say what, what, what you do in less than four words, people get it and they understand it and they can repeat it. It's simple, you know, but I think mm -hmm. keep the lights on is simple, you know, basic. So yeah, absolutely. That's very cool. Um, the, um, well, I think we talked about peace of mind, but uh, let's talk a little bit about, you said that there's uh, seven key areas that leaders need to focus on. Yeah. You talk about that in, in the new book. So uh, in, in, in your, your true north is your peace of mind, but there's, there's all these other things that need to consider on the other points of the compass, right? Yeah. And I'll just focus on two that I found later in my career were absolutely missing from this framework. And while uh, people process and tools, giving people the capability and capacity and also the interactions of people, mm -hmm. people are complex. We need to be able to coach that performance. And as people evolve their capability, what tools do they get? We give them to help prioritize their work and make good decisions. All of those are tactically important in the CEO's compass, but one of them was past. And the other one is pride and past is clearly understanding the culture, the people, because sometimes we bring new people on, we acquire businesses and we just hit the ground running saying, okay, now we need to produce more mm -hmm. and we got a greater portfolio. But when we spend a little time getting to know the people's rich culture and why was it that we brought them into the organization, we at least pay them respect and get, take the time to get to know them and understand why do we see them as quite valuable before we brought them on. But the other one, again, I found this when I was integrating another new business unit was the pride and pride is humanity plus intellectual property. What were they proud of? What had they done? What had they created? What was their unique skill that they did? And they were a superhero in their past world. What could we do with that and bring that mm -hmm. forward? Maybe not now, but in a time of crisis, we might need that expertise. Again, paying respect to their intellectual property. And I also say we need to capture their intellectual property. We think about these people as just subject matter experts, steady eddies, and they're replaceable. But as soon as they leave, you realize that now the business is at risk. So I think about people as intellectual property that you need to capture and institutionalize their tribal knowledge because you need that to be able to you know, run the business. So past and pride were two compass points I added in addition to obviously having a clear purpose, performance. How do we measure the people's capability to achieve that purpose? When all of these things line up, ultimately you get to true north, which is peace of mind. So eight compass points to true I north. I love this. This is so good. Past is so, so important. I love past and pride. Both of those key. And I think that bring that's that's the human element, right? It's the there are there are reasons there there there's a deep rich culture, especially as new leaders coming into an organization that's been around a long time you have to respect the past. You can't just come in and say, well, everything is trash. We're going to do it my way. And I've seen that. I've seen leaders fail when they've tried to do that. They don't respect the past and they don't respect what makes that team proud, the things that they have accomplished throughout their history that makes them special and makes them proud. And when you ignore that, I think you are, and you say, well, the only way we're going to do it is the way we're going to, the way I do it. And uh, you're going to, you're going to have a lot of people shut down because they're, they're, that that's, you know, they're humans and they're very proud of what they've done and they're proud of their past. And if you just throw that in the trash can on day one, you're going to have a lot of people not following you as a leader. And that's not a good place to be. I mean, sometimes the best tip as a leader, when you're going into a new situation is to go in with a blank slate. Yeah. Don't presume anything. I once went to a plant where they were having service issues, they had huge backlogs in their production area. And I was thinking and racking my brain, what tools, what framework, what procedures or processes I was going to put into place. And when we landed and we got there, we simply stood in one place. 
And we simply looked around and observed to see what was actually happening versus having preconceived notions, sometimes having a blank slate and just looking at the interactions of the people with the process, you have great um, wisdom. And what we realized in that situation was there was no visible leadership on the floor. They were so busy in meetings and other tasks and not being that frontline supervisor necessary to help the people to be successful. So go in with a blank slate. Don't bring in your playbook. It's there if you need it, but don't bring it in. Go in and understand what is and isn't working. Mm, I love it. That's a, like a page from Lean Manufacturing. Taichi Ono, draw a circle on the floor and observe and take notes. And, I'm uh, sorry. That's my upbringing too. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. I love it. I, I talk yeah. about it all the time is you want to learn about something, go to where it is and, and listen and, and observe and talk to the people that are actually doing the work. Yeah. And you'll, 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 you'll suddenly like, it, it, you know, everything opens jumps up out to of you. you. It jumps yeah. out. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Well, like I said, we got a similar background. So I, that, that's, that's great to hear that. So, uh, and, and something I talk about a lot as well. Well, this has been fantastic. Now, how can listeners find out more about you, uh, your podcast and your new book? So again, um, really appreciate the opportunity, John, to share stories with you and experiences, both positive and negative. But you know, if you want to learn more about me, there's two places, but let's start with the dropinceo.com website. You can find my blog, my book, the podcast and other resources there. But also if you want to connect with me direct, LinkedIn is my playground, Deborah Coviello, the drop-in CEO. Love to connect with your listeners and continue the conversation. That's fantastic. We'll, we'll, we'll put links in the show notes for that. And Deb, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing uh, your experiences. My pleasure, John. And thank you. Thank you again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. <laughs>